everybody, thanks for checking out the Furloughed Film Talks YouTube channel. Uh, for reviews, news, and the audio version of our podcast, please check out our website, furloughedfilmtalks.net. Be sure to check out all the social links below and also hit that subscribe button, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Awesome. So we are now joined by uh, Michael Armbruster, the writer of End of Sentence and also of The Woods. So we're really excited to have him. Thank you for uh, joining us. Yeah, my pleasure to be here. So how's uh, the last couple months been for you? <laughs> strange, yeah. very strange. Um, you know, I was talking with some friends. There's a lot of writers that live on our street, and they call it the writer's block. In That's fact. awesome. That's cool. um, but I was talking with one of them who was saying he expected to be so much more prolific during this downtime that we all have. Yeah. And it's like the exact opposite. Like none of you know, it's we have a son. He's at home, so that takes a lot more time. And, um, I don't know. You just you feel like you have all this time, but not a deadline, so you don't get as much done. Yeah, yeah. You don't feel like you have somebody like over, hovering over you to get everything done. It's it totally. almost seems like since we don't know how long this is gonna last, it's just gonna be like completely open ended, right? So it's like ah, yeah. it, it can I'll wait a couple it. weeks or so, right? All the time in the world, I'm gonna write every episode of season one of a TV show, you know, and right. it's, it's <laughs> just don't have that kind of time. Well, so with End of Sentence, what was kind of the inspiration behind, you know, writing this movie? Uh, it was it was a few things, I think, that came together. I mean, one was, like, to be totally honest, I wanted to write a road trip movie. Okay. And I love, like, the journey and I love the structure that that implies. And so part of it was as simple as that. And I got on the road and I wrote it, um, you know, as I went. I researched it and, and structured it and broke it as I went on the journey myself. Um, but I mean, the, I think the more important, there were a couple things going on too. Someone I had grown up with was in prison and it was for, you know, something a lot worse than auto theft. Okay. Like she was in this. And his mother passed away while he was in prison. And I, oh, wow. to me, just that lack of uh, ability to redeem yourself kind of was this sort of horrible thing. And so I, I had that in my head. And then, um, you know, the, the whole father-son thing is interesting to me. I grew up in the Midwest, and I think, you know, father-sons especially tend to be more reserved um, in general and in that part of the country, I think, especially. And I think just the, you know, the idea that when you're a little kid, you look at your dad like he's Superman, yeah. and then you start to get a little older, and you start to see the flaws and the imperfections, and, you know, perhaps there's some disappointment. And I think from the other side, because, I, like I said, I have a son as well, um, you see your kid when he's young is full of potential and possibilities. And then as your son gets older, you also start to see, you know, that it's not going to be smooth sailing the whole way. And then, and, and perhaps there's some disappointment on that end. And so I just wanted to play with that idea that, you know, if the problem with idealizing the situation for mm -hmm. fathers and sons, especially, um, you know, is, is not a great thing. And you just need to get past that and accept people for who they are and sort of let go of whatever preconceived notions or, problems you know you've been through together uh and so i wanted to be a story about redemption overall and i thought the road trip was a, a great setting for that so when you took originally took the road trip and was developing the story was that in america or did you uh do that over, overseas in ireland no totally u.s i mean i um it was shortly after i finished film school and i got on the road and i knew i wanted to start it in somewhere in the south and I knew I wanted it to, to end in somewhere that was much more expansive and wide open, like visually. And so it ended in Wyoming. And so I, oh, wow. I, I just, you know, got online and was researching where in the South. I, I got on the phone with uh, some people who worked at a prison in Alabama, um, set a meeting for them. I flew into Atlanta, drove over to this prison, met with, they were very gracious, gave me sort of all the ins and outs of how this actually works. I got mm. to see the prison and all that. So I, I liked that setting a lot. And then I just drove the road trip and it's my favorite thing in the world to do. I mean, you just stop where you want to yeah. stop. I mean, at That's one cool. point there were, there were all these like presidential libraries or monuments along oh, yeah. the way, like some quite obscure, you know, not obscure, but like presidents you don't really think of every day. Did you come and, to the uh, Dallas one? I didn't go to Dallas because okay. I went um, sort of, I was east of that. I okay. went up to like Missouri and I stopped in my hometown yeah. in St. Louis and across the state and then up to uh, you know, into Wyoming over that way. Um, but, you know, I, at one point there was this little motif where there were presidential museums that they were going to stop at for some reason. I mean, I didn't end up using it, but yeah. it was 
it was that. And then there was, you know, you find all this stuff along the way. I mean, there was a motif and it's still, it's still sort of in there, but it was, it was a bigger part of the original draft of, of food and of like feeding and the mother, you know, she leaves these frozen dinners for Frank in the story. And that's always been there after she had died to show her love. Well, when I got to Wyoming, I didn't know where I was going to set the ending. I didn't know if it was going to be mountains or whatever. And I found this lake that was really small called um, Cook Lake. And I'm like, Cook Lake, that's like perfect. There was like this little, you know, sort of thing yeah. that goes on in your brain or divine inspiration or whatever it is that sort of lets you find these things. And so being on the road trip was was great that way. Of course, it didn't end up in the U.S., but, right. you know, probably the better for it. You, you talked about going into that Alabama prison. Um, did you intentionally want to kind of highlight the American prison system and kind of, you know, some of the shortcomings of people who were let out? Was that something that you intentionally wanted in the movie? Uh, no, I, it was never really, uh, like, I, I was much more interested in sort of where Sean was and had to go and sort of how he saw himself and how he, I think, was dismissive of his own dignity and mm-hmm. potential. And it wasn't, I mean, there was there was more in earlier drafts about, you know, the situation in prison and the recidivism and mm-hmm. all of that. But um, but I was I was much more interested in, you know, the human condition of him versus making a commentary on our prison system. Okay. Yeah, which is very well done because yeah. it was really subtly put how it was so important for him to find employment afterwards, which is like the bottom line for people who, what our prison. prison system needs to improve on yeah. so yeah when you you talked about the road trip you took in america we were talking to elfer the other day and he said that you guys went over to ireland together what was it like yeah. going from an american road trip to doing your own irish road trip scary driving. <laughs> <laughs> i flew in i think a day before he came in he was so he used to live in la uh, and then moved to london and now he's in iceland where he's from originally but um, I think he was flying in from London at the time. And so I was in the day before him and had to get the car from the airport. Oh, no. And, you know, and I popped an Ambien for the flight and I was a little like out of it anyway. And, uh, and I remember sitting at that airport for like two and a half hours trying to work up the nerve to actually drive. It was early in the morning too, oh, and I wanted okay. to get, you know, I thought rush hour might be going on. But to drive on the wrong side of the, the other side of the road and the other side of the car, and it was a stick ship. I mean, the stuff in the movie is from, when I was renting a car and didn't realize, you know, everything's manual transmission basically. Right. Um, and then to drive in Dublin, like an old city oh, with yeah. construction here yeah. and pedestrians here, and I didn't know where I was going. And, you know, stupid me, I didn't get the nav system. I had maps because I sort of wanted the characters to be working from that. So it was, I scraped up the side of the car. I mean, even leaving the parking lot at, the, at Avis, I, I did something bad. Um, so anyway. <laughs> Driving aside, I mean, there were actually some things at one point in the script, too, about, uh, you know, what happens at roundabouts and all that. But yeah. uh, but, but other than that, it was uh, it was phenomenal. I mean, as soon as Elfar got in, he took the wheel because he was used to driving yeah. there. And um, we just explored. We did a similar thing to what I had done in the U.S. on a shorter timeline. But we drove and tried to discover things and settings that we wanted to use in the movie. <clears throat> and, of course, he and his crew went back later on to find the actual locations that would work. But... Um, you know, where would these characters go when you're setting it in a whole new country and still get the same feeling that you're really opening up to, um, you know, they end up in Donegal and it's just this like wide open space in, yeah. in Ireland. Um, so we wanted that same feel throughout. Is that something you usually do when you go into like a new project is you go out into the world to really kind of envelop yourself in the beginnings of the story? If I can, if, it, if I it's can possible. pull it off, I will do that. I mean, I've done it a few times, um, you know, in some places that you wouldn't, you know, go on vacation necessarily, but I love doing that. I mean, I kind of set a story in Green Bay, Wisconsin, and so I was up there for a weeks, and one time it was through Arkansas, parts of Arkansas, so I was doing that. Uh, I had a story that was set in the Bay Area, so I was in Oakland and San Francisco for a while, and, and it's my favorite thing, because you really get lost in your own writing too i mean it's not the distractions of your normal life but you're also right there where you're trying to you know mine the territory and find things for your characters to to use or stumble on or whatever yeah you're just kind of like engrossed in it like 24 7 i'm sure when you're outside of kind of your normal 
Yeah, there was a, a TV show I was doing, I was writing the pilot for, and um, it set it up in Marin County, too, up in Northern California. Okay. And I had done the research I needed to up there, um, but took the slow way coming back and spent two nights in a hotel in Bakersfield, you know, oh, wow. um, just because of what you just said. I mean, you need to sometimes just get away and immerse yourself, lock yourself in a room somewhere, you know, where you, you can't, you, you can, but you don't necessarily want to get out. When it's fresh, like like right now, like writing is so hard because you don't have those experiences and there's so much time. But when you're in oh. that moment, it's like, okay, like I'm here, like I need to get this down on paper while it's still fresh. I'm sure zombie apocalypse writers are doing great right now, yeah. but everyone else is <laughs> struggling. <laughs> so in the movie, like you, you obviously write, like writing all the drafts. When you were on set or when you saw the movie for the first time, what was like the one scene that you were like, wow? that translated so well from our, my drafts to, to the movie? Um, I would say, I mean, I think there's a lot of them. And I, you know, Elfar was not only wonderful to work at and a great human being, but a really skilled director. I mean, I think he Very. was so um, calm all the time on set. And, and, you know, the actors just transcended the material constantly, I think, too. I can't say enough nice things about John and Logan and, and Sarah. But I would say the one scene is when they're in the pub in Ireland and she's singing. Because Amazing. those kind of scenes, you write that on paper and you have it in your head, but that can also end up really cheese ball. You know, I mean, yeah. that could go oh, yeah. horribly wrong if it's not in, in the right hands. And they, and I actually happened to be in Ireland for that. I flew in for a couple of days on set and it was uh, a scene in the bar where, uh, where Logan and Sarah meet each other Okay. They were filming today, and then this scene was later, and uh, and I think it was, it was seeing John and just the look on his face. No, you know, he's just so yeah. hushed, but he holds it in so well. He's just such a restrained actor such that a good actor. really lets you know exactly what's going on in his head. Somehow, I don't know. It's the most remarkable thing, um, and I just thought it was so emotional to see him in that scene and to see Sarah uh, up there singing. I had no idea she could sing like that, and to see the musicians. And I don't know if Elfar mentioned to you, but we had stopped, and, and this is the thing I love as well, like just sort of organic music in places and how different it is in different parts of the world. Yeah. But in Ireland, you know, there really are a lot of um, like musicians in these pubs, and they're playing all kinds of music. And the, the musicians in that scene, I thought, were terrific. I mean, just the way they drew her out and brought her on the stage. The way she, they looked, interacted with her was great. I'm sorry? The way the lead singer interacted with Sarah was really cool. Yeah, yeah, I thought so too. And um, and even Logan, I mean, just the way he sort of, you, know, you can see what's going on in his head too. He's watching the dynamic that's starting to develop between these two and that's it. Um, so I, that one I thought just, you know, was so much better than I, I could have hoped for when, uh, when I saw it. Not only performed live, but then on the screen and the way it was cut and, and mixed and everything. From that scene, like you talked about Logan's character um, kind of taking it in. And I think that's one of the scenes where you can first kind of see this transition in him that he wants to make where, you know, he realizes the type of man he wants to be and like kind of the distance he is from where he is right now to that. And also he's like pushing his dad, like also into a transition. But how much of that was like running into a story where you were like conscious of um, Logan is Logan's character is trying to make this transition from being released from prison, seeking, you know, good employment, um, and, like, actually starting his real life, and then all of a sudden he's, like, runs uh, head first into his dad, wanting to drag him to Ireland. So, like, how much of that, like, kind of transition and um, change in Logan's character kind of did you have planned out going into the story? Um, I mean, I think, you know, the way I do this and probably a lot of people do is that you sort of, you do it from gut, I think at first, and then you get really analytical about it and you track their arc and you make sure that they're going from point A to point B um, emotionally in a logical progressive way rather than just sort of a all of a sudden way. So that, I mean, that was one step, a significant step. And of course what happens after that when he and his dad are in the hotel room is a huge step as well. I mean, it's, you know, it's like early in the earlier, I think when they first get to Ireland, 
is the first time you hear Frank sort of giving him a little bit of, of girl advice and talking about respect and things like that. Yeah. And of course, at that point, low, it's the last thing you want to hear from yeah. your dad, probably in general. And in this <laughs> case, really in particular, it's the last thing he wants to hear from his dad. But then he sees that, um, you know, the dignity that Frank brings to and the, and the manners and all that that he brings to the situation with Jewel is something he actually can learn from. And so he's, you know, seeing in a different light, I suppose, how he is a little bit or could be a little bit more like his father and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess to answer your question, it was all like pretty planned out. I mean, the actors just elevated or they, they study it as well, I think very analytically and intuitively just get it too. Um, but you know, that was, that was a key moment. Um, it was a key moment that sent him a little bit in the other direction at first, that, but that catalyzed the moment that happens after that. You know, yeah, it really changed it's interesting like in that same scene even Sarah is um, kind of shows him like hey she, there's a line where she says you know the nice men are the ones the, the kind men are the one that we spend the rest of our lives with like even she's pointing it out to him and she's trying to con him <laughs> in, yeah. in, that, yeah. in that moment I mean so. there's some truth in, in her character as well and you know not not everything gets to the screen for like a, a million reasons but mm -hmm. there was um, you know there was some trauma in her past too and you know the, the dignity thing was important to her and having someone treat yeah. her kindly and you get a little bit of that because of the situation that she's causing her to flee in the first place but there's um there's truth in that too i mean she's trying to con him and she's being opportunistic but i think there's you know also emotional truth in that you and sean recognizes that you mentioned there was stuff that was maybe not included in the movie there's a line that she says like she's running for her ex her ex-boyfriend who, who had been abusive was there going to be more background on kind of what happened with her and her ex-boyfriend there was n not so much on her ex-boyfriend and you you don't fully know if she's telling you the truth or yeah. not i mean brian to your point is she just conning them the whole time um but she there were there were other things where you know she was abused and there was you know there's a stepfather and things like that she, she sort of drops casually in conversation sometimes okay and you're not sure if she's trying to get pity and you know draw them in at some point or if it's really true and there was there was a line at some point that i don't think made in the final uh, movie later on between her and logan where he questions her about that and he says was all that yeah. just a lie were you yeah. just trying to you know get a car out of this situation and she tells him it's only it was just the tip of the iceberg and so you you sense that there's a lot more to you know her past similar to you know both frank and on some level sean's past too with with abuse and mm -hmm. you know trauma earlier in life no it's such a good movie and well thank you uh, we yeah we we love the movie and you've got another series coming out on netflix um in a couple weeks called the woods that's based off a book by a uh, Huh. Are you are you involved in that? No, no, no. So I I'm not sure what someone else mentioned that to me okay. uh, a couple days ago. I'll have to check into. I think so. I did I did adapt and sold a pilot. I adapted from a graphic novel um, the pilot for the woods, and we sold okay. it to Sci Fi Channel. Um, and I think there's another project floating around at Netflix. That yeah, would, it says on IMDb I don't know that you're attached related to it. or not, and I think there might be some mistake on. I don't know where you saw that. It was IMDb or something. It's on IMDb, so yeah. I, okay. I'm, I'll I'll check into that. Yeah. There's and the other one I'm no longer involved in, and I think they're figuring out if it's going to go on Peacock, their streaming service, okay. or if it's still in development. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I have another movie coming out on Netflix yes. in two weeks. Feel the beat. Uh, called Feel the Beat. Um, and it's uh, in their family division, um, and it is uh, it's a very different movie than End of Sentence. Yes. And it's a uh, sort of bad news bears set in the world of little girl dance competitions, and it's you know lots of music. I mean, there's definitely some heart to it as well, but um, but that so Netflix, you sort of have to write. There's a movie. On yeah, Netflix okay. So Netflix, you're doing something <laughs> on Netflix. Uh, uh, do you have anything else in the works that you're excited about, or uh, anything you can share? Yeah, there's um, I, there's a couple things I'm working on now that I, I can't quite say because I don't know if they're going to happen or not. But there's okay. a, a TV show coming out. Gosh, with the pandemic, I'm not sure when it's coming out now. It would have been early next spring okay. um, that I wrote on called Halo, which is based on the video game Halo. No what? way. Uh, okay. It, uh, it's going to be on Showtime, and it's it's uh, a great big you know great big show. 
and it's sort of the character driven version but hopefully still like keeping people happy who are huge fans of the of the video game um so we wrote that last year actually all the episodes for it last year and they've been casting it in pre-production and production now on that so how much did you guys uh, look at any other like live action halo stuff when you were doing that because there's been a few um like yeah mini stuff yeah, I mean, we sort of look, and there was a lot of this particular project had been in development for gosh, ten or twelve years with big, big yeah, names no, attached, but... as you might imagine, because it's a big property. But um, but you know, just hard to find the right way in, and it's mm -hmm. it's tricky. Yeah. You don't want to alienate fans of the game, but you also want to try to broaden the, the audience too. Um, there, so we looked at we looked at some of the other things. Um, some people in the room, I think, were more well versed. Some were less and i think it was a little bit by design that way i mean you don't want yeah. people to be too you know For weighted sure. by what's been done before when you're trying to create something new um but you also want to honor the past and and so it was a mix we looked at some things but not everything because there's a ton i don't know how there's a lot. much yeah. of a fan you are yeah no, i'm a we're, huge we're fan pretty, yeah we're yeah. pretty big nerds so. i don't know how much you played it but i used to play halo 2 and 3 just yeah, we played halo 3 a lot hundreds of hours came out. so yeah so, that's really really cool i'm we'll have to uh, we'll have to have you back on whenever that comes out in the spring yeah so sure. Sure. um cool we'll be we'll be looking out for that for sure but uh we really appreciate you taking the time and innocence was a great movie and we're hoping or i think right now it has a 93 percent on rotten tomatoes it was 94 so. percent last night so yeah it's i mean all the reviews i've seen for it have been great so yeah i'm, I'm glad it got out to vod yeah well i mean i'm so grateful Elfar and, and like I said, John and Logan and Sarah for the work they did on that. I thought it was just, uh, I was so pleased with it. You don't, you know, it's, you don't always find that. So um, it was yeah. fantastic and they were great to work with. Well, we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us and uh, go, please go check out End of Sentence. It's yeah. on VOD right now on Amazon. So, uh, Michael, thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. Pleasure. Have a good one. Hey, hey.